Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Assembling Your Dream Team, Lighting Collaboration on Broadway, presented by, by Bradley King and Nick Salium. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harmon. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenters and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop series on pro.harman.com. We're adding new sessions daily, and we have over 20 sessions scheduled for the remainder of August and for September, so watch for those on the calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to Bradley King and Nick Salium, the presenter for today's webinar. Bradley is a two-time Tony Award-winning lighting designer whose work includes the Broadway musicals Hades Town, Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812, and Flying Over Sunset. He has over 15 years experience developing new plays and musicals with some of theater's most innovative directors. Nick's most recent lighting design was Imaginary Comforts at the Berkeley Repertory Theater. Nick's recent associate credits include Moulin Rouge, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, Amelie, and Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. Nick is based in New York City. And now I'll pass it over to you, Bradley and Nick. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Brad, and thank you, Martin, for having us today. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I know we are all dispersed amongst the world. Um, and super glad you could join us today for a little chat about uh, what we call assembling your dream team which is um, what we, uh, the effective ways to put together a good lighting team, specifically as it relates to doing uh, theater on Broadway and, uh, and sort of on the, on the regional US model. Um, so we know that there's gonna be a lot of terminology that's different if you're coming from a concert background or if you're coming from a live events background. So we'll try and um, uh, keep things simple as much as we can um, and to kind of explain a lot of the terminology and the ways of working, which is pretty unique to um, the way theater gets produced in the world. Uh, and it can be kind of opaque and it can be kind of a black box. So a big goal of us, uh, of our webinar today is also to just shed some light on some things so that you, you are equipped with some language and some um, understanding of how this crazy commercial theater ecosystem uh, fits together, what specifically the lighting designer's role is in that ecosystem, and then how do you surround yourself with people um, who are gonna set you up for success um, producing theater. And again, specifically talking about Broadway in this webinar today, but lots of applicable things to um, nonprofit work, to institutional work, um, anything that is purely theatrical in nature. And I'm sure there's gonna be some corollaries to the concert and live events world too, and you can sort of draw them for yourself. But um, as we said in our intro, uh, my name is Bradley King. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I am a lighting designer, primarily working in theater and specifically um, have focused a lot of my work in the past five years, 10 years on developing new plays and new musicals. Um, just a brief how I got where I am in the three minute version. I like probably many of you on this call started doing theater in high school. I thought I wanted to be an actor like many of us. Um, and then sort of in my, my last year of high school, I uh, got into directing some plays that my friends were writing. And I should say, I went to a, a school that had a very intense sport program, but a like practically non-existent theater program. So it was very DIY. So not only was I acting and not only was I dabbling in directing, but I was hanging lights. I was painting very bad flats for sets. I was doing a very bad sewing job sewing costumes. I was making very rudimentary sound cues, but I sort of got bit by the, the entire theater bug early. Um, and that led me to pursuing an acting directing uh, degree at NYU for undergraduate or uni for those of you in the UK. Um, and it was about six months into my time at NYU that I realized, oh, I don't want to be an actor. I want to be a director. Directors have all the power. Directors are the ones, you know, generating these amazing ideas. And so I very quickly switched to a directing track for theater and then uh, pursued that for a couple of years and then 
it, the program I was in, just by the nature of the program, you didn't actually get to direct a show until your third year of university. Um, and you got to direct one 30 minute play. But I also had 10 classmates also directing 30 minute plays, all of whom needed designers. And I had had this experience in high school. I knew how to paint a flat. I knew how to hang a light. And just so week one, a friend of mine said, hey, will you do lights for my 30 minute play? And then I did that. And then week two, someone else asked. And then week four, someone else asked. Someone else asked. So that by the time I had finished my first semester of my last year in university, I had lit like 14 of these 30 minute plays and only directed one of them and realized, oh, this is a career path. This is a thing people do. And as a lighting designer, I'm not being looked to for all of the answers to every question like a director is. Um, and so it was significantly less pressure uh, and I found it a lot more enjoyable. Uh, and I had a great design mentor at NYU undergrad, um, a fantastic designer by the name of Lenore Doxy, who we unfortunately lost to cancer a couple years ago. Um, but she really took me under my wing as sort of my first mentor. And I encourage you to look up her work um, because she is one of the most brilliant uh, users of color that uh, designed in New York. She had a long career in the off-Broadway world, in the dance world. Um, she was a founding member of Target Margin Theater. Um, and just really an incredible, incredible influence on me. And thanks to her, I sort of ended up um, interning at Seattle Repertory Theater, which is a major regional theater in the US um, in Seattle. And that's where I met folks like uh, Chris Ackerland. That's where I met Marcus Doshi. That's where I met Don Holder. And any of you US designers or theater designers, these names will be very familiar to you. Don is the lighting designer of The Lion King. Chris Ackerland won the Tony for Light in the Piazza and most recently for Indecent. Um, and that is also where I met the late, great Hal Binkley, um, who we just lost last week. And um, Hal was, again, one of the biggest influences on my early career. And if it hadn't been for Seattle Repertory Theater, uh, we never would have met. Uh, and Jane Cox as well, who Nick and I both worked for early in our careers on Broadway, who is just one of the most lovely human beings and talented designers working today. Um, and so that experience at Seattle Repertory Theater led me back to New York for a couple years of freelancing. And then I decided I, it was time to go back to graduate school because I knew exactly what I wanted to get. And I will tell you all right now, if anyone is considering graduate school, that's great. But I want you to know exactly why you are going to graduate school and exactly what you are hoping to get out of it before you make application. And we can go into that later. Um, and then after graduate school, which was, oh my goodness, 10 years ago, um, I just went back to the freelance life. And here we are today. Um, and I will give Nick a couple minutes to talk about himself. Uh, yeah, Nick Soliam here, and I use he and pronouns. And uh, again, I uh, want to repeat what Bradley said. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Martin, for having us. And so I, uh, my three-minute version is that I grew up in Burbank, California, which is north of LA, which is a big production capital of film and television. But my family and it was uh, going to the theater every week at the Pantages in the Amundsen. We had season subscriptions. My mom was a big lover of theater. And so that uh, always led me away from the film and TV uh, camera lifestyle towards the live performance. And uh, so I went to a school called Cal State Long Beach and did uh, studied lighting under David Jacques, uh, who um, I, uh, runs the the lighting pro ran the lighting program there. I believe he's in the process of uh, retiring there. And then after school, I was looking around LA and realized the place I really needed to be was New York. And so I ended up at NYU for graduate school the same year as Bradley, where we met there. And when I graduated, I started freelancing and that uh, freelance work led me uh, to spend a majority of my time as an assistant and associate. And that uh, over the 10 years since we graduated, I've uh, been uh, working and assisting all around the country and the world. And like uh, Laura said, the, the show's running right now, Moulin Rouge and Harry Potter. And Bradley and I uh, did Natasha Pierre 
together and, uh, and several others. Uh, and I have one note about the webinar. We're actually going to get into some nitty gritty uh, techniques to how Bradley and I communicate. And it's, uh, please uh, answer, send and save all of your questions because we'll be happy to answer all of them at the end. And uh, so if there's any questions at all about any of the specific stuff we use, happy to answer that as well as general stuff. We apologize in advance if this gets too technically in the weeds, but <laughs> um, so let's just start with a basic overview of the creative team on your typical Broadway musical. Um, and I'll start when I'm hired as the lighting designer, you know, there are very sort of specific tasks that go along with that. Namely, um, I'm responsible for the design of the lighting for the production. And this is going to be sort of universal, no matter what craft you're working in. But um, yeah, you are in charge of the lighting and you are in charge of telling the story that you and your entire design team are working to tell. Um, you're the key collaborator with the playwright, with the composer, with the director, and of course your design team. Um, and most importantly, you are in the Broadway ecosystem, you're sort of the boss of a department. And most importantly, and what I really want to hammer home today is you are in charge of setting the culture of your working environment. Um, that when you are uh, a designer, and really not even just lighting designer, when you are a set designer, when you are a costume designer, when you are any designer on a Broadway show, um, it is incumbent upon you to set the culture and the sort of the ecosystem of respect of your department um, so that it is welcoming, so that it is generous, so that it is collaborative, um, so that you are setting the tone for what kind of room is going to be run. Um, and that means, uh, is this a room that people want to be in? Is this a room that's welcoming to all folks? Um, and I really just want you to think about that as we move forward. Uh, so the associate in the world of Broadway is a, these are, these are things of how I interpret it, sort of the, the right-hand collaborator of the lighting designer. And this person is responsible for smooth communication, not only between members of the lighting team, but between the production departments. And I like to think of my job as sort of a chief of staff outside the Oval Office, as it were, and all communication, I like to run through me. And so I can have a, the, you know, the large scale view of everything as well as the details. And so I can know the implications of changes and, the, and also who needs to know what pieces of information. And uh, the associate is the key person for the production electrician, programmer, and stage manager. And that, I mean, we, we can talk about different ways of communication. But in, in in usually when I am working on a show and the way I like to work is that having the communication run through me is is useful. So that's what that means with the key point person. And so on a Broadway musical, there's usually another person uh, with the title of assistant lighting designer and their job is uh, follow spots, follow spots, follow spots. And uh, the, there, it's a whole job that is uh, we entrust that person with the design of the fall spots for the show. And that is their number one job. And um, it is a full-time job and incredibly difficult of tracking who and what and levels and face levels and skin tone and balance. And they are a key member. And, but so that is their primary job. But if there's time, the assistant usually can end up helping uh, with other tasks, uh, such as focus and, and documentation and such. But the first thing first is uh, follow spots in the world of commercial musicals. We should say that like, if you can just jump back. Yep, real quick. yep, yep, yep. Um, this is very unique to a, not only Broadway, but also just the way the US sort of functions in terms of these positions. Um, I've done a little bit of work in the UK. I know it's very different there and that a lot more work falls to the designer and then maybe the designer um, is lucky to have an associate or an assistant help out with all of this. But um, in the US model, uh, 
it's really, it's three jobs when you're doing a major Broadway musical. But also a lot of this, Brad, is how you and I run shows together as well. Yes. So uh, bo both things are true. And so we're going to cover a little bit now on the production side. And here are just some other folks that you're going to encounter when you are working on a Broadway musical. And this is a point that a lot of people get confused on because it's a term that gets sort of thrown around a lot. And it's like, what is this pink contract thing? And really pink contract refers to production personnel, to so stagehands who are hired by the show as opposed to by the theater. And they work for the producers. And these folks are generally your programmer. And I say generally because it's always a little bit different. And I know Justin Freeman's on this call and I know he's gonna correct me if, I'm, <laughs> if I step out, but they tend to be your programmer. They tend to be your production electrician, um, which is a, a, a job sort of like a master electrician at an institutional theater, but not totally like a master electrician at an institutional theater. Um, and then you will, depending on the size of your show, you might have additional pink contract electricians and that will occasionally be your lead follow spot operator or it could be your board operator or if you're a really, really big show, it could be a sort of in-house moving light technician. And then in terms of splitting up between pink contract and not the stagehands that are employed by the theater are the other divide. And so that would be your house electrician who uh, is employed by the theater and the theater owners and runs uh, the loading crew and the electrician crew and also the other fall spots and perhaps a deck electrician who runs on the deck. And so that divide is based on who technically is the employer. Is it the show or is it the theater? And then of course, if you've got a big show, you've got a shop team. And these uh, include people like your account rep, your project managers, if there's a lot of set electrics that need to be engineered. Um, the engineering team from the house that's going to sort of lay out all of your set electrics. The engineering that goes into uh, complicated pieces of scenery or automation. And when lighting needs to interface with automation, flying light ladders, flying custom light ladders. Um, Nick can talk a lot about this in terms of Harry Potter and Moulin Rouge, just the amount of work that goes into even before a single piece of scenery gets loaded into the theater, months and months of planning of integration between set, um, electrics and scenery. Well, and integration is a great word because then on the uh, supervisor side, the production manager or production supervisor who, uh, are a key position in the department, not, not lighting department, but in the show rather, that uh, have, um, are responsible for integration and, and communication flow and keeping everything working together. Now this next slide, I'm gonna tease a little bit because I'm really excited about it because to the best of my knowledge, I haven't seen anything like this before and uh, I think it's really useful. So, <laughs> um, the, Bradley and I came up with this idea to sort of make a communication flow, as it were, and this is everything we've talked about, how there are theater owners and producers, which lead to a playwright and a director and a choreographer, the design team sort of in the middle of the page. And then uh, splitting off from the producers is technical supervision, production managers and the like. And then under lighting designer, all these arrows, I want to point out coming in and out of associate and lighting, because as the way I like to be as the chief of staff, as it were, the communication going through. This is really just to give you like an overview of how many people there are working on even a small Broadway show. And especially if you are the associate, just how many, um, how many lines of communication you are juggling. Um, because as Nick says, when you're operating in a chief of staff position, you really want to be the central um, contact point for all of these things. And then you need to sort of have the ability or gain the ability to filter out what needs to get kicked up to the lighting designer. What can I deal with on my own? What do I need to get from what pieces of information do I need from other departments? What 
um, pieces of information do other departments need to know? It's just this all this sort of whole big juggling mess. Um, and this, I expect that people in all forms of entertainment have something like this, but in terms of uh, Broadway, this, uh, this is what's relevant to how we do our work. Um, I did realize that I'm missing a sort of big um, uh, box on this web, and that's general management, which you can sort of put in the same box as producers. Like right. the producers directly work with a general manager or a general management company, some of which you may be familiar, ones like Baseline, which is the general manager for Hamilton, um, 101 Productions, Bespoke Productions, uh, RCI. These are, these are um, companies that basically act as line producers for a show um, because of course everything on Broadway is ad hoc. It, it is created out of nothing. Like there's not, um, there is not a national theater. There is not a, I'm going to qualify that all of the, the commercial work on Broadway is ad hoc. There are some institutions, some uh, nonprofit institutions that also operate on Broadway, which is a hybrid model of what we're talking about right now, but I don't want to confuse the issue too much there. <laughs> but basically every, every element of a Broadway show is created from scratch and that includes the entire sort of employment structure. And so the first step for producers is to hire a general manager who then start working with a technical supervisor um, and the creative team to sort of birth this whole big production. And this is just a very basic overview of the number of people, just the ones interfacing with lighting, because you see no costume stuff on here. You don't see a lot of set stuff on here. You don't see a lot of sound stuff on here, but like, just imagine this growing four or five times in size. And then you sort of get an idea of just how many people would be employed on a Broadway show and why it is so important that we all get back to work as quickly as possible. <laughs> Uh, great. So the next chunk of time, we're going to, here comes the nitty gritty, I promised. So Bradley and I are both, um, I would say like Vectorworks natives, as it were. We did do, we did learn hand drawing uh, back in grad school, but basically our whole process from start to finish is a Vectorworks from any part of the world. No drafting table required. And we use Drop, Dropbox to share things back and forth. And one of the things that I want to point out is that we in a, uh, are, are usually working in some stage of running prep and tech for several shows at a time. And one of the things that I have found incredibly helpful is to have standardized ways that you work and that you can find things quickly because... You, that's a problem when you when you have productions out at various stages along the way, and one of the things that uh, I first things I do get folder a folder structure. Every show I do has a folder structure that is exactly the same, and I my mouse movements are are uh, you know almost automatic at this point where I can go and look for the calendar and I can go and look for the vectorworks. And it's just a, 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 a little cheat, as it were, and muscle memory as we are um, working on many things all at once. But in terms of this, when we're working with Brad and I at the same time, you could run into tr a little bit of trouble. So what we call the football for files that are potentially opened by multiple people. And... Uh, oftentimes when Brad and I are, are starting our prep on the show, we will both need the Vectorworks file. And rather than um, end up with conflicted copies or working with the multi-user functions of Vectorworks, we've decided the easiest and cleanest way is to just decide who has the football <laughs> and who has the file and who can work in it. Which basically just means like, getting on your preferred method of chat and saying like, hey, I need to do some work in the file. Have you closed it out? Do you have the file open? And it also means that you have to be very vigilant about not leaving open files on your desktop, that when you're done for the day, when you're gonna take, or when you're gonna take a break, you save and you close. Um, and that also brings up a very um, important question about who you want to give access to this folder, because, um, it's entirely possible that all 50 people from the previous page want access to some of this information. Uh, frequently, the show itself will set up a Dropbox. 
if the show itself sets up a Dropbox, I still encourage, I, I'm going to demand of everyone that you maintain your own private Dropbox, like Nick is suggesting here, and then selectively copy and paste information into the show Dropbox. Um, you want to restrict access to these files to the barest minimum people who need them at any given time. Um, and especially when you're talking about things like Vectorworks files, when you're talking about things like Lightwrite files, which I know is unique to us here in America and is slowly gaining a little bit of steam in the UK, um, PDF it. Send everyone PDFs unless they absolutely, for some reason, need the Vectorworks file. So just think again uh, in terms of controlling access to your work and can making things easier um, and always making sure that the information that you're pushing out is up to date. Um, this is really just for you, your associate, your assistant, and your programmer, and sometimes your production electrician. So as the same token of rules for Dropbox, I always set up Vectorworks files first before they go to Bradley using the exact same structure every time. And uh, you can see here, yeah, there we go. The, my structure is identical on every show. Uh, and that way I know exactly where things are. Muscle memory, uh, I can just find it, turn things on and off as needed. And uh, one other uh, thing is that well, I want to point out that your origins have to be aligned as you're copying and pasting from new revisions or using external references. Just take a moment to make sure that the, your datum, your zero, zero, is always at, in the same place. Just, I just wanted to put that one in there. But I've found this incredibly useful for Brad as well. Just, he can just pop a, a know where he's going to do his rough, know where we're going to put his areas, know where the deck information is, for example. And it's always the same every time we're prepping a new show. It's uh, a little bit of a refrain, but it, it helps us work consistently and clearly with each other. So after Nick sets up this template file and drops it in the Dropbox, then I get to work. Um, I use Joshua Bengiat's series of plugins, um, BeamDraw, or now BeamViz, I think is the newest one, which is a pretty incredible worksheeting tool that works with Vectorworks Spotlight. Um, and we could spend an entire webinar on Vectorworks Spotlight and BeamDraw. Um, I'm sure many of you are gonna be familiar with it. Uh, and if not, just Google Joshua Bengiat. Uh, he's a great designer and he is a great pro, um, computer programmer who has developed this sort of incredible series of plugins um, for, figuring out where to put your lights. So here you can see um, uh, sort of a version of the rough of a show that Nick and I did called Bernhardt Hamlet uh, at Roundabout a couple of years ago. And here I actually, um, because I am, a, as Nick said, a Vectorworks native and I am of a slightly younger generation of, of designer, um, I don't do my roughs on onion scan. I don't like draw out with triangles on paper. Um, I do it all digitally now and that means a little bit of rudimentary 3D work when it comes to the scenery to figure out, oh, is this Lico gonna get under that, uh, under that portal or is this gonna make the shot through the door? Um, and if you would ask me th three or four years ago, would 3D ever be a thing you were interested in? I would say absolutely not, but it's, it's become easy enough. And especially as set designers um, are doing more and more of their drafting in 3D. You can just pull all this information in. And especially as Nick says, if you take the time to set up your drawing in advance, so that it is very easy to either just copy paste right to zero to zero or import a reference file, um, you, can, you can make some of this 3D stuff work for you. And it's gonna be even more important moving forward as um, those of you who use the EOS system and get start to play around with augmented a little bit more, which would we were doing in beta on um, flying over sunset before the shutdown. Um, it's a really very powerful tool if you take the time to set it up correctly. So if you've been on the fence about 3D up until this point, I think the time is to get off the fence uh, and start just learning how to extrude some base. You don't need much. You just need a couple of extruded rectangles right there. That's all that portal is, is three extruded rectangles. Um, and you can see, um, some basic beam cones, and you can do a lot of your homework ahead of time. 
So I will put, and the other cool thing that BeamViz does is uh, as you lay all these things out, it is very, very easy just to directly convert them into lighting instruments to drop right on the plot. So I will do that. And then if you go to the next slide, Nick. Yep. It turns into that almost immediately with one button click. So as you can see, this is a rough, but it's not actually that rough. Um, and there, of course, it varies show by show, how much time we have, how much time did I waste prior to the plot deadline. But on this one, Nick and I were working remotely. Nick was in, I think in New York, or maybe even off, I don't know where Nick was. I was in Minneapolis when we were trying to put this together. Um, and we were just emailing files back and forth. And on this one, I had some extra time. So this is the rough I ended up sending back to Nick, which you can see really just needed channel numbers and um, dimensions and sort of cleanup stuff put on. And so taking Brad's rough from there, turning it into a final plot, where I did take a second to talk about how we communicate throughout that process and deal with revisions and notes. And uh, on a Mac, really quick, that's so quick, I love it so much, command shift, Four, opens a screenshot, you clip it, you annotate it, and paste it into your chat. I do that 150 times a day when I'm working on a plot. And screenshot, annotate, copy and paste, and send. Uh, and it doesn't require PDFing, doesn't require, it's not to scale, but it's not a big problem. And here's some examples of some things I've sent, sent off. And um, like, as you can see, like a, a, a potential ladder move, some new lights, and even up to some point clouds and clip cubes in a 3D model of a show. And you don't have to render anything, you don't have to PDF it, command shift four, copy, paste, send. That's uh, how I wanna work quickly and clearly, and it's there for searching and for looking. And so well, if Brad is, Anywhere else in tech, on a run at the grocery store, you know, pull it up, take a look. Oh yeah, that ladder move is fine. Send it off, send it back. It's quick and easy. And so uh, relating that to our particular chat app, uh, we want to find something that's searchable, that's really important as well. And so this is just a quick uh, example of us uh, talking to each other during a load-in. There's a new piece of decking that wasn't on any drawing, <laughs> which I'm sure no one has ever experienced before, ever. Right, all the theater. scenery is always exactly where everyone says it was gonna be on drawing one, right? Yeah. And so this particular is, is WhatsApp and it's searchable and allows uh, during load-in, quick photo, send it off, all of that. And so all those screenshots end up in one thread and that is uh, one of, a bit of a trouble when uh, we're all over the place with iMessage and SMS and Facebook message. And it's, it's a bit of a jumble of messaging. So we, it's, we discussed and we picked one. We picked WhatsApp. So, and it's searchable is a key feature of that. Um, and similarly, when you're sending emails back and forth, uh, you come up with a system so that, especially if you have a team that's working on more than one show or more than one production, if you're trying to do Moulin Rouge London and Moulin Rouge Australia at the same time, uh, you know, it helps a lot if you're, every subject is, you know, MR, MA, MR Australia or MR London, you know, um, come up with ways that you can find this information quickly. Yeah, searchable is your friend. And so moving on to uh, how uh, in the theater will work, here is a schematic of an example layout from Town Broadway. And I will just say, it takes like two seconds to draw out your tech table, but then you get everything exactly where you want it. That's the most amazing thing about working on Broadway is that I can hand someone like Justin Freeman or Kevin Barry a sketch like this, and then I will walk into the room and everything will be exactly where I asked for it. And even if you're working at a smaller theater, if you send this to the production manager ahead of time, they can red flag things like, hey, well, we don't actually have four channel com. We only have two channel com. Is that gonna be a problem? Yes, it's going to be a problem. Or no, it's not going to be a problem. Um, it's just a way of, again, communicating clearly. All of this, uh, you know, if you take one thing away from this webinar today, um, you know, the, the lighting team, like any relationship in life, 
thrives on good and clear communication. <laughs> uh, well said. And I think some of this information is going to be shown in the photo in the next slide as an example. Uh, this is um, this is the this is the Hades Town tech table setup as it ended up being after a little bit of finagling, but you can see there, this is the way I like to set up my station and it's um, panorama, so it's a little distorted. Um, but you can see I'm a huge fan of digital magic sheets. I stopped using paper magic sheets a couple years ago and now I do all of my magic sheets through the console. Um, I have the thing you to keep in mind if you're gonna do digital magic sheets with EOS, especially on a show of any size, or any great size, you need additional monitors to the ones you were already using. You can't use them instead of your cue list and your tombstones. So just keep that in mind. Um, you can see I've got my conventional layout all the way to the left. Right in front of me is the moving light layout because that's where 99% of my show is being queued from. I've got a vertical cue list because it's more space efficient. Um, and then I've got my traditional tombstone layout all off to the right. Com for me always goes on my left because I want to be able to push the buttons with my left hand while also being able to write with my right hand because I'm right-handed. Um, and the laptop gets put away as soon as tech starts because there's just not room. Up in uh, the far right corner there, those white screens are uh, Moving Light Assistant and Stamp, which are two programs we're going to talk to talk about when we get a little bit further along about video recording and documentation. And an example of one of mine, which is um, very similar but slightly different, same thing, calm, always left hand, drive, as it were, right hand, notebook, quick, computer in front for vectorworks and notes. Uh, I typically run with uh, two pucks and playback PSD and channels and then magic sheets. I, I could be either way, but a, uh, same thing to Dropbox and Directorworks. I, a similar setup every time you work always makes you feel uh, more at home and more able to get to the information you need quicker. And so I do something very similar to this at uh, um, almost every show. So now we're getting into dry tech, which is basically the set's been loaded in, focus has happened. Um, we sort of skipped over this a little bit, but especially on Broadway, focus is usually a multi-day process um, because nothing is ever ready on time. And you sort of end up stealing time when you can. Um, but also that usually means that uh, the final room run, as we call it, so the last run of the show in the rehearsal room is generally happening at the same time as focus. And it's far more important for the designer to see the final room run than it is um, to be focusing. So especially on Broadway, it's usually the associate and the assistant who handle focus. So if you are not used to, or if you, um, insist on focusing your own lights, just know that and be aware of the schedule. Um, or it's a great time to talk to your assistant and your associate about how the rig wants to be focused so that if you are called away to do something else, um, someone's, someone's there uh, who's able to do it. Um, dry tech, you know, it, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. It's definitely gonna happen on a big Broadway show with automation. Um, and unlike the concert world, we usually have like a day of dry tech as opposed to weeks. Um, but it is no less expensive. So when you are ready to do dry tech, it's important that you maximize your time. Think about who's in that room and why dry tech is happening. Is it for you, the lighting designer? Is it for you and your programmer to get moving light focuses roughed in? Is it for about automation? Is it about setting automation cues? It's generally about scenery and automation just because it's more complicated and it's more deadly if it goes wrong. But that doesn't mean that you as the designer and the associate and the programmer can't use this time to start getting ready. Um, because the most important thing about working on Broadway is working quickly because it is so expensive. Um, so just be there, even if nothing's going on, be working with your programmer, grab some presets. If you know everything's happening down right, just grab as many presets as you can down right and stick them in the board so that you're ready for them and you're not searching for them or having to make them once tech actually starts. Sketch ahead, 
This is um, a method I use uh, and it served me pretty well, but it, I always prefer to do uh, a million rough passes at a show than to slowly methodically take my time page by page. Because lighting design is an arc. It involves time and it involves moving forward. And until you get an entire first pass through the show and watch it in time, you have no idea what your design looks like. So the faster you can get through the show that first time so that you can get back and no one knows what the show looks like for the first day and a half. You're figuring out your rig, you're figuring out whether or not your tools are correct, whether you've placed your tools in the right spot, whether your color's right, it takes time to figure all this out. Just in the same way that a costume designer takes time to figure out their color palette, and uh, whether or not um, you know, their mediums are correct, you don't have the luxury of, of time in the studio to figure this out. You're doing it with everyone breathing down your neck, which can be very exciting or very nerve wracking depending on your personality. For me, it's a little bit of both. But one of the ways I allay this is to use as much time in the room as I can ahead of time so that I'm not sitting down blind um, when we're ready for like page one, measure one, downbeat. So always sketch ahead. If you're doing big, long, complicated numbers with lots of effects, put in dummy cues. You can give them to stage management. It's who cares if nothing fires that first time, at least the stage manager gets used to calling them um, musically where they are on the beat. And I sort of operate on a ma mantra of try to never be the one that the rest of the room is waiting on. And dry tech is one of the ways that you can help with that by getting sketching ahead. It's easier to update a cue than it is to record a cue. So put those blank numbers in, make sure your blocks are in the correct spaces. Um, Make sure the stage manager has enough of these in their book that um, they can practice calling it. Um, talk to your programmer. What does your programmer need? Does your programmer need three hours to get sorted? Does your programmer need three hours to work on some color stuff or work on some effect stuff? Um, discuss this ahead of time and you can use dry tech when you're waiting around for scenery to get some of this stuff done. And as we see stuff like augmented, um, more filter into the Broadway world. Broadway has traditionally been very anti um, previs because so much of lighting a Broadway show is about light on people as opposed to just light on effecty stuff or aerial effects. Um, but use these new tools like Augmented to help you get a little bit ahead. Um, and lastly, remember whose time this is. Um, if it's all about scenery automation, then don't stand up and scream that you need more time for moving lights. Uh, be respectful of the schedule. Um, and the time to make that request is well in advance of when dry tech's happening, when you're discussing your schedule you know, for load in the month before. Um, and here's a very important piece of advice that I would give everyone. And that's, I always push for the first day or at least the first chunk of time on the first day of tech to be a spacing day so that the director can come in figure stuff out with the actors, figure out the entrances, figure out if the deck's gonna work, is the deck too slippery, is this doorway wide enough? That all takes time with people on stage. Um, and you can use that to take a little bit of pressure off yourself to start playing with systems, playing with ideas, um, sketching ahead. Um, and it's a sort of lower stress way of beginning a, a stressful tech process. All right, what's next? So the next is uh, a more about the general tone of the room that Bradley started off with and I appreciated very much about what type of room do people want to be in and what type of room do people do good work? And the, there's different, uh, different sort of traits and information that we can focus on for each role. So if Brad wants to walk yeah. us through. Um, and I want to drill this into everyone. Lives are not at risk during tech, unless we're talking about scenery automation coming in, by which I mean, this is not brain surgery. This is not neurosurgery. Um, we're putting on a play. And so just keep that in the back of your head. I know it's stressful. I know everyone wants to yell. I know things aren't moving fast enough, but just take a deep breath. Everything's going to be okay. Um, stress is not a reason to act out. Stress is not a reason to be an asshole. Um, it is important that you remain open, that you remain generous. You know, actually, Nick, can you just populate all these and I'll go sure, through? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I want you uh, to hammer home the difference between standing up for yourself and getting what you need. Um, you know, if you've been asking for four days, straight days to do a note and you're not getting that time and the note's screwing up the show, then like, yes, like, please 
tomorrow we need 15 minutes. The lighting department needs 15 minutes of dark time, or the lighting department needs an hour of dark time. Everyone wants a very limited amount of time during, especially when we get to notes. Um, there are ways to stand up for yourself, but there are also ways to do that in ways that are not disrespectful, that are not, um, don't be a diva is what I'm saying. Um, and this goes doubly true if you are white, if you are cis and you are male, because you are afforded opportunities to be a diva that no one else is, and it's time to stop that. So lead by example, put a stop to it. Um, Again, communication, sit down with your team before you get in the room and talk about how you wanna work with each other. We are presenting a very specific way that Nick and I work together. It's not the same way that I work with other associates that I've worked with. And it, Nick, it's not the same way Nick works with, with associates he has or with design, other designers that he is working as an associate at. So we've given you one way of sort of outlining this, but um, to, you know, take what works for you. Um, because ultimately it is all about communication, communication, communication. So then uh, I, I'm just going to pop through the associate here. So I, the, what, it's, it's a skill that's in, it, that is um, only acquired by spending more time in these high stress environments is how to read a room. And it, sensing when the proper time to approach someone is an imp is an important skill you you have a question and asking someone in the heat of a of a tricky moment is not going to be as appropriate as asking someone the same question when it's calmer and the same thing goes for breaks, that sometimes people would be happy to talk about a technical problem on, on a five, but sometimes people are checking in with their family. I know personally, my tens, I'm often checking in with things outside of the room that I am in because uh, family is in different time zones. And so, um, it's oftentimes when you can check in. So sometimes breaks are okay to bring up a question and sometimes breaks aren't. And then the, in general, don't just assume that you understood notes and ideas. And it's so much better in uh, my opinion, just say, did you mean move the 10 degree six feet over here? And, um, you know, and point or get a laser pointer or like, Always be a hundred percent clear before you have the electricians go do it. It's always better to ask and understand before giving a bad note and things like that. So then also related to that uh, web of communication is knowing who knows the answers to the questions that you have. Let's uh, say, you're missing a preset on the button of a number and you, and you feel like you need to get it on stage, but the, 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 the time is very crunched and you're running out of time, perhaps someone in Corio knows exactly where that button is and can help you out. And so knowing that web of communication in a Broadway theater, knowing who knows the information that you need is a big part of the associate's job. And then uh, we all know that every person on that web of communication is incredibly busy with their own minutia, not, or not even minutia, if that has a connotation of their own details. And uh, the different, and so needing things from other departments, you have to know when, when uh, to ask as a reminder and when to ask as, as a nag and avoid that, if at all possible. We're trying to create environments that people are, can do good work and can work together. And then, so moving on to the assistant lighting designer. So uh, the, once the actors are on stage, you are, to me, considered the designer of the fall spots. And that is all of your job. And um, so to and then that relates, so I would say that your, your uh, fall spot operators are your closest colleagues from that point on. And even though you might be generating their sheets, they, your operators are going to be using their sheets. So uh, speak and ask 
and um, ask them how they want it. I had an operator who wanted a box around an autofollow in dark red, for instance. And there's no reason why you can't provide that for people who are working a very difficult job as well. And again, if you don't have something that you need, if, you, if your tech table is in a place where you can't see the stage, then you can't do your job. Like, so never be afraid to ask for what you need. So now after that larger view, we're pivoting back again to some more nitty gritty. And speaking about a Q synopsis. So the question about who is it, who is it for relates to a discussion about, <laughs> as I've had many times, over who gets to use the notes column, <laughs> for, for instance. Who gets to put what in the notes column? Is it the programmer's column to leave notes for themselves? Is it the designer's column to put uh, lyrics? Is it the associate's column to put, uh, you know, cue notes? Like, I, you, I've worked in every single type of situation. So, uh, have the discussion and ask about it. Don't just assume everyone is gonna work exactly the same way. I know that Brad, when I work with Brad, for example, uh, wants his label to be something that is usually very specific to the way he thinks about the cue. So while we're writing quickly on stage and he's writing cues that don't have labels, so recording Q50, recording Q60, recording Q60. And I might throw on something for me, like a pull down left, bump to black. But I know for a fact that Bradley almost always has an idea of what he wants that label to be. And he'll go back and write it over himself. And it's something that makes it make sense for his mind. Yeah, and put something there so you just don't end up with a whole queue stack of empty queues. <laughs> because especially like when you're getting when you're barreling through a number and you're in a rhythm and you're in the zone and you're like ah first chorus first chorus and you just record record 25 30 35 40 it's really helpful to have someone sort of on your wavelength coming behind you saying chorus 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 first 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 and then i will generally go back in you can see um the example i pulled here is just like the first 10 cues from hadestown um you know, gods, men, what are those? Are those lyrics? Are those positions? Or like in my, I, but in my head, I know exactly what they are. And that's really all that I need. Um, if your stage manager is going to be relying on the label column, then you might want, you know, they might want the exact lyric that the cue gets called on. Um, you can see in the notes column, we actually use the notes column for follow spots because our follow spots on Hadestown are following along on their own set of monitors. Um, so all the spot cues are in the notes column. Um, but again, there are so many different ways of doing things. Just talk about it beforehand so that you don't go in there just blindly doing something like, oh, I thought I got the notes column when your programmer was intending on using it. So talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, again, it's a refrain. <laughs> communicate, <laughs> communicate about how you want to work to make for a better working environment. And it's sort of meta thinking about the work that's in front of you. And so uh, we have a whole section for, uh, so this is an example magic sheet, and then we're gonna get to notes as the process goes throughout previews. So this is an example magic sheet. This is and just this a, yeah, a closer view of um, how I work and how I use magic sheets. Uh, this one, Sometimes per people prefer to lay it out themselves. Sometimes they'll ask their assistant or the associates to do it. Um, I had Alex Mannix, who was the assistant on Hadestown. We've done a number of shows together. She knows exactly how I like to have the magic sheets laid out. So she jumped on this and did it for me. And it's beautiful. Uh, this is like one way that you can use EOS magic sheets. And I, I don't want to get too bogged down into uh, the nitty gritty of how, but like it's a very powerful tool and it's one I, I like to use. And the other great thing about um, EOS Magic Sheets is they can be updated immediately. Like you don't have to get into Vectorworks, change a number, print it out, or get your whiteout out and, or, or your eraser. Um, you know, you can, if you've swapped a patch, if you've added a light, you can just very quickly go in, copy paste, change the channel, exit, and you're, you're up and running. 
So as the chief of staff, as it were, of a show, keeping all of the notes and is uh, a large part of what I am doing in the room at the time. And I, we, I break it out into several different categories. Uh, physical notes, worker focus notes, that anything that requires an electrician to complete in the morning or in the evening. And I, uh, the way I work, I have that notepad to the right of my mouse. It's in the same spot. I always am, am much faster at jotting down a note. Oh, channel 12 looks dropped. Or, uh, in, or channel 26 is burnt out or anything like that. It's always like handwritten down on the page. And then it's over the headset, fast and furious. Then I type it up and it go, I go into a, a particular file maker that I have been using over many years that uh, has been sort of in co uh, collaboration with other people like Craig, Craig Stetson Mueller. And we, it's sort of like this thing that is floating around a little bit. I have some screenshots of what it ends up looking like. And uh, the thing is that uh, it has to be prioritized. It must be. Oh, it's, it's not, so you cannot give an electrician two pages of notes that are not prioritized and they have a four hour morning work call. It's, and for me, I use two numbers with the, I, so I use, for example, one note 1.1 1 .1 is usually something that must happen or else we will have very big problems on stage in the coming afternoon, all the way down to 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1, you know, so like in category one are things that must happen that day, all the way down to 9.9, .9, which is usually, we're probably gonna run out of time and never ever gonna get to this note, but I gotta write it down <laughs> just because. Just, I, just to give an example, a 1.1 1 .1 kind of note is like, we've lost a leg of power in the theater. <laughs> and a 9.9 .9 is we've got the wrong frost in this leg. So just like keep that in the back of your head it's, it's when you're prioritizing. But it's just how I personally do it. And then the, and then the uh, prioritization is not, um, is not duplicated on a notes list. So, uh, and this was um, from an electrician, uh, Kevin Berry, whom I work with an often lot and often a lot of times and he always wants to say in the morning hey nick you can cross off 2.3 or for example uh, and so they don't they don't um overlap on any given notes list and uh that uh is uh, physical notes so moving to designer notes again everyone has them differently uh during during runs i know brad is often taking his own notes but sometimes that's not the case whereas um if you're if you're still on headset or sitting next to a designer, uh, you've got to have a discussion about who who is going to take the notes and where are you sitting? Is it appropriate to have a screen? Is it appropriate to have a pad of paper? Um, Bradley, if you want to speak to that. Oh yeah, so um, I always prefer, and Nick has been very gracious in letting me do this the past couple of shows we've done, but especially when it gets to invited dress or your first couple runs when you still have your tech table, um, I just want to talk the notes out loud over headset and not write, write them down. Um, because time writing down notes when I don't have to is time that I'm looking at a pad of paper and not looking at a stage. Now, granted, this is very case by case. If you're doing a long day's journey in tonight and you've got one queue running for three hours, there's plenty of time to look at the, at the paper. There's plenty of time to take 10 seconds to write it down. But if you're in the middle of a number that's got 400 cues and two pages, um, you don't even have time to like get the note out of your pen before you've moved on to your next three notes. So um, Nick and I will talk about this beforehand and I will just speak over headset all the notes. Like that cue is too slow. This cue needs more blue. That effect's too fast. We need a better effect here. And Nick just is really great about putting them all into um, into FileMaker and at least getting close to where we were in the number or close enough that he can give me a prompt that will change something in my brain. And I'm like, oh, I know exactly where, you're, where that is. So uh, other categories, stage manager notes. Um, who is going to be giving the notes? I like to, I, I 
think it's useful for it to be one person, usually throughout the process. And whether that is the designer or the associate is, is, is work, I've worked on different cases. Um, and at the same time, it could be over email. I've done it different ways, but I want to talk to about some pitfalls on, on both versions. So on shows where, where I am the one giving the notes and uh, the most secure, safe way that I feel to do it is often to find five minutes in the stage manager's office in the morning the next day after. Things are calmer, you can have your scripts, any sort of um, recording of the, of the events. And uh, the trouble is with this way is that yes, you are both, you're both present in the moment, but you're taking two people's valuable time to do it. And I just, to be just to be honest on bigger shows it's hard it is very difficult to carve out 10 minutes of the state production stage manager and the associate lighting designer at 9 or 10 in the morning the next day and it especially on something as simple as there's a new cue in this song that cue note has to get to the stage manager it must otherwise there will be a problem in the show and um, so getting that time carved out is something that is crucial and requires a discussion. So on some cases you, with some stage managers, they might be uh, agreeable to getting a list over emails, a list over email, and then discuss anything that doesn't make sense in, uh, in person. And so that can add a little bit of flexibility, but I, I'm, hesitant to do it in all cases I because of the an email can get missed so quickly in these tech weeks <laughs> so and so if the stage manager misses a note that there's a new cue the show is it gonna be impacted that night and so that's that's why being careful about sending notes over email is important and then uh, always always, I never give a stage manager notes without a page number or for example, measure numbers because they could have a calling script that is this thick and you go and you say, I like you 185 was a, a tiny bit early yesterday. And I'm like, well, can you give me some context? Can you help me out? Help me out a little bit. And so it's just a little bit of courtesy. I never ever give a stage manager note without a page number and just That's say, hey. Yeah. Universal rule. Always yeah. helping stage managers out. Yeah, exactly. Hey, can you look at page 97 first? And then you know where you are. And then the last one is probably the, the single most flexible way of, of notes, like how our director notes coming into the department. Uh, Brad and I have worked in very diff different situations. Um, associate to associate, director to designer, emails, text messages at four in the morning. Uh, do, they, do they remember to include me so I can put them into the file maker? Do they not? It, it, it's probably the most variable <laughs> in my experience. Um, I know we're, we, are, we are gonna run over a little bit and we do wanna get, uh, have time for questions at the end. So just to move through these next pieces a little bit quickly, um, I think, We've got a, a, a slide of what Nick's FileMaker looks yeah, like. Yeah, it's pretty, this we don't have, we spent all the time on this, so these two are quickly. So here's a, a Qnote uh, example printer, uh, printed out PDF that from every day, it's important to know when the note was taken. And so if, it, if a note's been sitting there for a week, maybe it's not so valid anymore. And then uh, a physical note example, Again, prioritized. Uh, so, uh, and then I'm actually uh, going to, while we're talking about notes, I'm going to skip a slide, Brad, and then come back to it because uh, preview notes, we'll, we'll come back to video record, I promise. So um, just my particular preview note setup is these days uh, an iPad mini, uh, with notability, and I split screen with the Q list, 
from with using Dan Murfin's QList app, and which is called QTrack. And I just wanted to point out a little, uh, uh, if you don't know it already, there is an accessibility function on an iPad that is called reduce white point, which uh, gets the iPad screen down to an absolute minimum. And I have found it acceptable in even the darkest of uh, theaters. And even with the uh, some, where darkness is incredibly important on shows like Harry Potter, for instance, I have found that the iPad can get dark enough to take uh, preview notes using a digital screen. But that's that's just uh, me at the moment. So um, Brad, yeah, Brad wants yeah, and so on, on the designer end, um, just think about where you're sitting every night. If you're watching, if you've got 10 previews and you watch all 10 previews from the same seat, that's a complete waste of your, your time and uh, a waste of uh, a chance to get out and see how the show looks like from the balcony. See how it looks like from the extreme right. You'll miss stuff if you don't move around. Um, and if you've got the ability to spread your team out as well, that's great. You know, don't lock down. Sometimes someone needs to babysit the queue list. Sometimes there's been way too many changes during the day and someone needs to be there um, helping the board up and the stage manager through a complicated new sequence. But if you're not, if things are settled, then like split up, put one person in the balcony, one person in the mez, one person like way in the front of the orchestra. Um, in terms of doing notes during preview, like you're going to have pages and pages and pages of cue notes that you're taking. Um, you know, you are within your right and to ask for dark time to do these cue notes. Um, but be realistic about how much time you're going to get. If half the set's missing and needs to be loaded in the morning, you are not going to get three hours of dark time. Um, this is also a great way to learn how to do as many notes as you can without dark time. Um, Nick and I have both learned how to focus in full work light with people routing the deck around us. And it's great to be flexible. Um, sometimes you really need dark time. Sometimes you are talking about adjusting levels from like 12% to 8% and that needs full show conditions. But sometimes you're just playing with the BPM of an effect and you know, who cares what's going on in the room when you're doing that. Um, I always prioritize my cue notes three ways. One, you must fix anything that is unsafe. And you will find this out from stage management, from production management, from your GMs. If something is unsafe, it must be dealt with. Two, director notes come first for me. Even if I don't agree with them, I put them up. I say, hey, I'm gonna do this, but then I want us to watch for this and see what happens. And then we can have a discussion about it. But rather than fight a director saying like, well, I don't agree with you wanting to go blue here, go blue there, look at it and then have a discussion about it. Um, and then unfortunately your notes come last um, and they will build up and you will get them done, I promise. But even beyond that is a programmer's notes about marking and cleaning and, oh, yeah. and yeah. associates notes about work light that's backstage. And so uh, it piles up for sure. <laughs> and so the last thing we're gonna talk about before we get to the conclusions in Q and A is a video record and I'm gonna go back one slide. And so it's actually something that has developed over the, the last 10 years that uh, I've been working when the first Broadway shows I worked on, it was not an, accept an acceptable thing, but it's led, Choreo has led the way of being, wanting to see and review and analyze and scrutinize. And, uh, but there still could always be specific rules about what is acceptable and when it, and when it, what is not acceptable to, to use the recording. So your stage manager is gonna be uh, the point person on that. But uh, these days it's a massive, massive benefit to your show to be able to analyze and review anything that is going on. And uh, in terms of specifics, there are a few different ways to do it. It does not have to be anything fancy. Uh, iPhone or a GoPro on a clamp on a tech table is, gets you, I would say 90%, 95% of the benefit of having a video of the show is acquired by a, a, an iPhone on a stand on a tech table. And these, the last, the last two bullet options are just playing with getting, getting you in the margins, five percent more. So, um, 
their uh, stamp is a is a software that uh, uses <laughs> Nick's crazy solution. Uh, stamp is a is an all in one software that uh, that one runs on Mac and takes in the front of house feed from a balcony rail camera, and includes it with your QS. I do personally, I do have a crazy solution that is hardware based, not software based. And that uh, to me is uh, a bit more reliable. It uses a, a piece of hardware that you can get from your rental shop called a decimator that makes a picture in picture view. And this example here uh, shows that the, there's a picture in picture view of the cue list and the time code embedded in the video file. And um, that, again, is playing with the 5% margins of useful, but can be so useful in a show that's time-coded and a queue is late, for example. This, so what you're seeing here is a nomad from EOS embed into the picture-in-picture -picture view, which, which is a piece of hardware called the decimator, which is merged with the front-of-house camera feed. And so that nomad does nothing else but play that, but show this view of the time code and the queue list. Um, the one benefit we found on Hades Town using Stamp is when you operate Stamp, when you when you view this the video in the Stamp software itself, um, it has an embedded cue list in it that talks to EOS via OSC, I think, um, so that as the video is playing, you can see the cues going. Or you can scroll down and say like, ah, where was Q500? And you click on Q500 and the video jumps to exactly when Q500 went. So it can be, um, but it's, it's software based and it's a bit buggy. And we had some successes, some failures with it on Hades Town. But um, the idea of having a video recording of a run or of a big chunk of a run um, can make doing Q notes really, really easy. And, uh, one way we took that even further on Hades Town was you saw that stamp monitor on our tech table. That was actually duplicated on my programmer's tech table up in the balcony. She was screen sharing into it so that we could jump to a thing and say like, ah, do you see where this moving light focus was off? It needs to move three feet further left and she could see exactly where it was and just fix it right there. But th this might seem uh, a little bit of a no brainer in so coming of uh, people coming from some entertainment industries, but on Broadway, it is a thing that has developed rapidly and over the course of the last few years as uh, it has become adapted. Uh, it, it used to not be the norm and not be allowed at all within the past 10 years. So uh, we're gonna- Again, yeah. check with your stage manager. Yep. <laughs> and so skipping past the preview slide again and into our con conclusions and then we'll do Q&A. But I think as we have tried to hammer over and over again, uh, you know, effective communications techniques are all about communication um, and being open with each other and being generous with one another and setting expectations. And then, you know, also if something's not working, like saying so, and let's figure out how we can fix it. Um, and that yeah, starts- it's, It is worth saying that it is, it's, I do often will have a check-in, like with uh, Neil Austin on Harry Potter. That was my first time working with him. Is the show coming over from the UK? So I would go and say, "Hey, how are you? How is this going? Do you? Can I do? What can you do? What can I do? Is our communication going?" We sit on the edge of the deck and discuss how the process and the discussion is working out. And again, this is how uh, just one way of it works in the US Broadway model and how Bradley and I are working together in the tools that we use. And related to that is have those communications and try some, the way someone else wants to do it. It might be better. You never know, don't get stuck. And then be kind and generous. And this is the thing, it's all, the job is hard, the hours are hard, this, the stress is high, the, the desire to deliver is high, but everyone else in that room is in going through the exact same boat. So just treat others how you would want to be treated is how I would say. And that, hand in hand with that, um, especially 
and if you are in a leadership leadership role, and if you are white, and if you are male, recognize your power um, and recognize your privilege. And how are you using that power to make your room um, welcoming, equitable, inclusive? Um, you know, as we've been as we've been forced into pause, um, we're talking a lot about what is the world we want to go back to, and how does it look different from the world we just came. Um, and that's really, really deeply important to me is that when we come back, we are seriously um, addressing issues of inequity and harm that uh, we need to go about rectifying. And that starts, you know, it can start very basically. It can start um, with how you're putting your team together. It can start with what kind of room you're running, whether or not you're standing up for your collaborators. Um, these are all things that need to be thought of as we go back. Um, and it especially involves advocating for your team. Um, if you are in a position of power, advocating for those who have less of it. Um, you know, again, think about um, think about where you are on that power structure and how you can how you can bring others um, up with you. Uh, well said. And uh, with that, that will lead us to our Q and A segment. All right, guys, I'm back. <laughs> and I do have some questions for you. Um, the first one is asking, how much input and control do you have on choosing what specific lighting fixture or manufacturer to use when your show budget gets tight? So that is an interesting question. And it sort of gets to the process of laying out and budgeting a show back in, in prep and interfacing with your shop team. And especially in the U.S. and especially uh, on Broadway, you know, there are basically two lighting shops. There's PRG and there's Christie. And when budgets get tight, uh, the first thing you are going to need to do is start looking at what are you asking the shop to buy that they might not already have versus what is on the shelf and available. So, um, a, a knowledge of what is on the shelf and available goes a long way towards hitting those budget targets the first, you know, without stretching out into a six month budgeting process. Like for instance, I know that Christie is going to mainly have Martin gear. I know they're going to have encores. I know they're going to have Vipers. If I want some crazy Ariton light, or if I want some crazy uh, concert world light, I know that's going to be, um, PRG might have it, but they might not. I know that um, I'm going to have to really push. There has to be a really good reason why I need that specific fixture if it's not on the shelf. Um, and I'm going to need to convince my producers because if it's not on the shelf, the shop's going to have to buy it and it's going to cost you a lot of money in your prep fee. So knowing what, uh, what gear you have available and what gear is readily available is very important when you're designing responsibly. Okay, next question is asking, what is one tool that you find indispensable? Like you want to take that one? Oh, yeah, I'm indispensable. I guess probably the, probably my phone, I'd say, of, of all the things, like all of the, like I mentioned, the chief of staff style, the all of the communication comes in and out of the phone. And it's not uncommon to be sitting in tech but and texting with your colleagues on the associate level of director and choreo and scenery. And that, that, that line of communication for me is always open. And that, and um, having it be un, un, unintrusive and ubiquitous is makes it probably indispensable for me keeping the communication open even people sitting exactly one table over from me and because you're in tech i can say hey i need to see the show drop for five minutes and, and send that text off so i i probably since my job is night uh, so much communication i'd probably say my phone uh and I might say a good laser pointer <laughs> because, you know, when you're trying to point out to a light that needs to move six inches and it's dark up there, then you're like, wait, that one, that one, you're trying to count seven moving heads in from the end of a truss, just grab that laser pointer, point right at it. And everyone knows exactly where you're pointing. 
All right, next question. How does a Broadway LD pick a new associate? Are they simply assistants that move up? That's a great question. Um, and it's, it's one that I've sort of been grappling with uh, because traditionally, um, you know, you, you work with the people you know. So then how do you meet new people? And a lot of times that'll be, I am doing a show regionally and there will be an assistant sort of in-house at the regional theater who then moves to New York and gets in touch with me later. Um, sometimes it could be um, a mutual friend. It could be someone I saw at a um, design show who had just come out of grad school. But I've been thinking a lot about, you know, gates and gatekeeping. Um, and I'm always, I've always been sort of, you know, I get a, the occasional resume sent to me via email. And like, I look, the first thing I do is I like look to see who, who has this person worked with that I know. But I also realized that's a way of like really constraining the available labor, like the, the people who are out there um, willing to work. Um, if we just work with our friends all the time. So I'd say that's the way it had been working, but I'm very interested in changing that way of working. And I'm, I'm far more interested in um, either reaching out to people who are recommended to me or people who have contacted me and just like having a conversation. Um, what are they interested in? What are they like as a, uh, as a human being? Ultimately, do you want to spend 18 hours sitting next to me at a table every day? Um, because that's really the most important um, piece of this. So um, that's sort of a non-answer to your question, but it's, uh, it's, it's in flux for me at the moment. All right, next question. You mentioned drawing in 3D and using ETC's Augment. Do you now need to start receiving real world accurate 3D, dr 3D drawings from the scenic department? And are there 3D accurate drawings of the venues available too? Uh, <laughs> I, I'll take this one. <laughs> yeah. um, no, is that is the answer. There aren't 3D accurate real world drawings. And that's where a point cloud comes in. And this is a tool that is a LIDAR scanner that is sent into a theater and provides a, a point by point map of the venue. And now Granted that not every show will work and uh, employ a company to do a LIDAR scan of the theater, um, but shows that are doing modifications to the front of house and shows that are doing large installations in the front of house, it would be, it, I can make a very compelling argument that I will save the production money if you, if you laser scan the theater and send me a point cloud and I can get the box booms right, and I can get the, and I can check the shots ahead of time. And so the, the that is not a resource that exists, and you don't you don't get it from the theater. You'll often get every manner of file, mini CADs that haven't been updated, and DWGs with unlimited numbers of classes. But it is something that ha the, the LiDAR scan point cloud usually starts with me or if there's renovations happening in our, they're very common in architecture. But um, I have no problem advocating for that, for me to get my own work and do it right the first time. Okay, next question. Are associates required to be union members on Broadway? Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, Bradley, we are both members of the 829 union, uh, um, but yeah. So the, the answer to that question is no. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyone, uh, the, the union contract covers the work being done. It, is, it does not cover the person. So uh, the Broadway contract says that anyone working as an associate on Broadway must make application to the union, but you do not need to be an existing union member to assist on Broadway. What will happen is once you sign your contract, you will then have to join the union, but it is not a precondition for being hired, which is a, is a big point of confusion for a lot of folks. But that means you can sign your contract if you got a gig. That the union should never be thought of as a barrier. It's, it should be thought of as your 
um, ally they've collectively bargained for you. Yeah. Okay, next question. What is the newest software or tool that you recently started using to improve your workflow? Um, well, Augmented is the newest, but it, it's not really in my workflow yet, I'd say. Um, I, I, probably, the, probably Notability is the newest thing. I, I was a longtime user of pen and paper in previews for, and um, it, it's a relatively recent thing for me uh, personally to have, uh, to take a, a note on a digital screen, but I could, I could not ignore having the cue list side by side with Notability. And that is probably my newest thing that I've integrated. And, uh... I mean, I've been using them for a while, but they keep getting updated. But like Josh Bengiot's BeamViz plugins are just so indispensable for me for how I'm laying out a show and how I start thinking about design. And that combined with more and more, adding more and more 3D drafting to my workflow um, has been sort of the biggest change for me. Okay, next question. Um, Nick talked about this a little, but when working with a new designer, what's the best thing an assistant or associate can do in pre-production to make sure the relationship starts off on the right foot? As a designer, what gives you confidence that a new associate or ALD is up to the task? Uh, so for the, for the first part, it's getting to know the person, I'd say. Um, it's... It, yeah, the, the relationship is so important to know about people's tendencies and, and tastes in light that uh, getting to know the person is, is uh, very important. This is, a, this is a work environment where, like we've been saying, it's a lot of hours in a room with these people and um, getting, it, it goes both ways that you, as, a, as people, you can have a a, a collaborative communication style. And that usually starts with email or coffee or Skype or, or, or Zoom these days. And I, I've met new designers in all of those ways uh, above. And it, and it could be um, uh, an interview process I've had. I've could, it could have been straight through recommendations. It could have been any, any which ways. But in terms of that, that was a little, um, a little vague, but in terms of concrete things, it would be, yeah, trying to get to know the human and hope that the other human is trying to get to know you and make sure that you both um, are, are interested in, in collaborating. And one of the, one of the things that is um, important in a designer associate relationship, this is a concrete thing is, what can, what um, contributions is the designer interested in a collaborator as an associate? Um, are you interested in hearing, hey, if I, what if we tried that bump as a, as a one second instead? Are you interested in me as a designer and do you want that collaboration? And that, I asked that question, to be honest, on a lot of interviews or coffees. I say, are you interested in me as a designer in my contributions to the show? That's something that I will ask. And I, and I have asked designers that I am interviewing and inter, being interviewed by, are, are you uh, assuming good communication, assuming the right time, assuming not stressful, are you interested in hearing what I have to, to think about the light? And so that's a concrete thing. And then in, in terms of um, confidence that you're up to the task, I mean, that, a lot of that is on me, right? Like I, um, I'm, it's on me to not set you up for failure. So if this is the first time that we're working together, you're probably not going to be in the hot seat of a $25 million musical. Like we're going to start with something a little bit more manageable with a little bit more lower stakes. Um, and again, that's sort of like, that, that gets to knowing each other as human beings first. And it's, um, 
you know, am I setting you up for success? Uh, and I think that's also important to realize as an associate, like knowing when, and I, you know, trust your gut, like your spidey sense, like, am I in over my head? Is this going to be a bad collaboration? Um, am I going to be valued in this relationship? These are all things to ask yourself. All right, next question. After being away from the industry for a long while, how would one go about restarting networking and portfolio rebuilding? Do you want to I mean, <laughs> yeah, but is, isn't that something we all want to know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just say like in pre, in the, in the before times, um, I would say that like, you know, I have even worked with people who have simply just texted me or texted mutual friends like, hey, I'm in town. Like, I know you're in tech, can I come watch? And that leads to a, a face to a name. It leads to generally a conversation. It leads to a cup of coffee together. Um, that, you know, uh, it requires having the time available to do that. And it requires having, um, you know, being able to not intern. I'm never going to um, suggest that anyone intern for no money um, because I, I'm no longer a, a believer in unpaid internships or even lowly paid internships. But if you do have the time to come sit and watch for a little bit um, and see if the person you're, you're observing, see if they're as a designer and a human is working in a way that you find interesting and that you think you would benefit from, that can be a really good in. Um, having a, a face to a name like instantly vaults you up on my list as opposed to just a resume in my inbox. If we've met, if we've said hello, if we have shared a biscotti, um, who knows if we will ever do any of these things again. I am hopeful, but um, just a little bit of face-to-face -face time goes a long way, much more so than a portfolio or a resume or uh, an email. And that can be hard. I want to acknowledge that that's really hard um, and not everyone's going to be able to do that. All right. It looks like that was the last question that came in. So I wanted to thank you both so much for your time today. This is a really great session. Um, we appreciate you presenting in our learning session series. And for everyone who attended today, thank you for your time as well. Um, we do have some upcoming sessions. So if you're interested in additional Martin webinars, you can go to pro.harman.com and see the full calendar. Um, and the recorded version of this session will be uh, posted out on our channels in a few days. So thanks, Nick and Bradley. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.